Well, in terms of confidence, I'm 10 out of 10. We know exactly how to do it. We don't know if we can do it fast enough. This is Climate Curious, the podcast for people who are bored, scared, or confused by climate change. I'm Marion Pasha, the director and curator at TEDx London and the co-host of this podcast, alongside the amazing Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Hurst, activist and advocate exploring what positive masculinities can look like and self-confessed climate normie. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, I, I'm super excited. I really like talking about this topic. Um, I really... I think there are so many places we can go, but I want to start with a really simple one. You know, you head up this this carbon free electricity program. What is like how important is electricity when we're talking about climate change? Electricity is forty percent of global CO two emissions, approximately. No, it's not. It is. No, it's not. No, people say this. Uh, everything can't be forty percent. That is not. But, are you being serious? Yeah, it, that that's the facts, and it depends on which country you're in, the relative contribution. But globally, it's a somewhere in the neighborhood of forty percent as of last wow. year. And um, going forward, it's actually an even bigger part of the solution because we need to electrify the rest of the economy with clean electricity to have a chance at minimizing the worst effects of climate change. So let's dig into that forty percent. Why is that? Like, what is that coming from? Coal and gas, mostly coal. So okay, there's coal and gas. No, no, there's not coal and gas in electricity. Coal and gas is being used to create electricity, and that is dirty electricity. That's right. We've got uh, thousands of coal plants, thousands of gas plants all over the world that burn these fossil fuels, emitting carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the air, producing electricity that powers our homes and businesses. Oh, man. <laughs> this is. I'm sorry. I am so. Every this time, is tough. Four, four seasons in bed, as you should not. Be. <laughs> I know. I shouldn't be surprised every single time. I'm shocked by the reality of the situation. So let's talk a little bit about the sources again. So, coal is that used mainly in some parts of the world? Is gas used more in other parts? Like what? Because I feel like I thought coal was dead in in the like in Europe or in the yeah. Like what is the reality? Because again, we're so these things are so opaque that yeah. I think as a consumer you just don't really know, right? Well, I want to pick up on what you said. Coal is not quite dead; it's dying, right. but it's it's holding on for dear life. And in some parts of the world, it's even growing. Okay. We've had remarkable declines in coal fired electricity generation in the U.S., in other parts of the North, uh, but in other parts of the world, there are many new coal plants under construction and many coal plants that are very new and uh, unless there's some intervention, will keep running for a long, long time. This always shocks me because I do feel, I don't know, because when you are saying somewhere like the U.K. or in the Global North, you just do, uh, even, even though we have coal plants too in Europe, like, I don't know, you just feel like this is something that should is of the... 1800s. Coal, yeah, yeah. coal is like Mary Poppins. Yeah, and like, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, what's the Oliver Twist where they're like in the it's, in it, the chimneys? It, yeah. it just feels dirty and it feels smoggy oh. and it doesn't it doesn't feel like the time of now. But then gas. Now this is like a big thing, obviously, because the UK is going through an energy crisis right now, and, and bills mm-hmm. are going to be going up insanely. Yes, and, and they already have, and it's unreasonably have, unreasonably. <laughs> Gas is a big part of this as well, right? Big part of creating our electricity. How does just tell us a bit about about that? Yeah, um, gas has uh, really increased in its share of electricity generation globally in the last ten years. In the United States, where I work, uh, starting in the mid two thousands, we had the shale revolution, where a bunch of smart folks figured out how to fracture shale deep underground and get way more gas out way more cheaply uh, than that had been possible before. And we're starting to see that in other parts of the world, including potentially in the UK and other parts of Europe. So gas is now or has been until very recently more abundant and cheaper than it ever had been for. And then, of course, everything changed last year and this year with the invasion of Ukraine and the global energy crisis. But that's the that's the trajectory and why gas is such a hot topic right now. Is that fracking? Is that what? Yes, exactly. I wasn't sure if fracking was a bad word or if that was an actual yeah, term. Yeah. Okay, right. and and just as a quick aside, why is fracking so extremely bad? Uh, or is it so extremely bad? There are uh, studies that show that communities near well pads that use hydraulic fracturing have diminished water quality, have toxins that leak oh. from the wells and actually harm people's health nearby. So that's one of the reasons why folks are concerned about uh, fracking. Right. Okay. Makes sense. 
You wouldn't so, want to be near that. So electricity that's produced by gas and electricity that's produced by coal is not good electricity. There's other ways of making electricity that are good ways of... Is that right? There is, yeah. There are... Yeah. Well, once you make it, electricity is electricity. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 just it's, it's fungible. <laughs> it's, it's a commodity. It's electrons moving around in wires, right. right? But you're right. The way that you produce it really matters. Again, with coal and gas, we're contributing 40% of global CO2 every year. Okay. So let's think... Okay, so that... That's important. So it basically, we cannot get to the future we want to get to that's within a relatively safe degree of warming and all of the things we talk about without addressing this problem. It seems so big. How do we address it? Like, how do you eat this elephant? <laughs> 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 well, actually, you need to start as close to the customer as possible. At, at RMI, where I work, we always start with energy efficiency. The easiest way to get pollution out of our electricity system is to use less electricity. So we work on, with utilities often, insulating people's homes so that they don't need as much electricity during the summer and the winter to keep their homes cozy. We work on other efficient appliances like water heaters, for example, and, and many other things, LED light bulbs. So use less electricity. That's always the first step. And then we need to clean up the grid that we have so that even as we use less, we are emitting even less carbon. So that means uh, installing solar projects and wind farms, both onshore and offshore, and other renewable energy technologies that can displace coal and gas on the grid and produce the same commodity electricity, but without any carbon dioxide emissions okay so use use less electricity clean up the grid yeah when, well is there a literal grid just sorry stupid question but is there a like an actual yeah you see it every day in the countryside for example you'll see tall transmission towers right, overhead right, right, right. those are carrying uh, electricity from all sources of generation to cities factories homes and cleaning it up means replacing it with new like uh replacing it with things that i don't understand what is clean up? Yeah, so right now we have a, you know a giant coal plant connected to transmission lines oh, and a right. giant gas plant connected to transmission lines. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is we need to run those coal and gas plants less and less often mm -hmm. and eventually retire them all together while bringing on uh, installing big projects and small projects of mm -hmm. solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, potentially nuclear, all these carbon-free sources of generation. Right, that makes sense. So wire them up to like wind turbines. So right. I've solved it, everyone. Don't worry. <laughs> Once again, I have fixed it's the, the problem. That's the easy button right <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah. The, the good thing is we can reuse the existing grid, right? We don't need to rip out these transmission lines that right. we've already bought and paid for. Here in the U.S., the grid is round numbers, $5 trillion oh worth of capital gosh. sitting in the ground that we've built over the past a uh, hundred years, and right. we can reuse most of that as we improve it going into the next century. Okay. Okay. I want to find out. You know, we talk about like solar and wind and all of these other green sources of electricity, which sound awesome. Are we there yet in terms of price? Are we there yet in terms of technology? Like, can we make these transitions that we need to make? Yes, definitively, yes. And it's getting cheaper and easier every year as technology keeps advancing. As businesses start to realize the opportunities if they move quickly. One of the one of the best things I think coming out of the latest science is the observation that we actually need to start increasing electricity demand and using that increased uh, electricity supply to power other sectors of the economy. So for example, most homes here in the United States, and I believe in the UK as well, are heated by direct use of fossil fuels like natural gas, mm -hmm. which is expensive. It is inefficient. It also creates many problems with methane leakage out of the pipes that go into your homes, for example. We need to take those gas furnaces out of homes and we need to replace them with highly efficient modern electric heat pumps. That's going to skyrocket electricity demand over the next 10 to 20 years. And that sounds hard to do, but it's actually a huge opportunity for electric utilities who now have an opportunity to sell more electricity in an era of otherwise declining sales. So again, it's that kind of business opportunity for utilities that is becoming even more apparent every year. So it's in their own self-interest to start 
you know, in a way, making this transition. That that specific element of it is yeah. for sure electric heat pumps, electric vehicles, selling more kilowatt hours to clean up uh, the uses outside of uh, the power system. Let me start that yeah. over. <laughs> <laughs> they have an opportunity to sell more electricity to people who buy an electric vehicle or to people who buy an electric heat pump and grow their sales. That's easy. The, the hard part is actually what to do with all the old stuff, yeah. right? We have, as I said earlier, hundreds, thousands of gas plants and coal plants around the world mm. that all have some debt associated with them, right? Some uh, assets tied up in loans that help finance the construction of those power plants mm. over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We need to find ways to wind down that debt quickly so that we can in a financially sound way, actually replace those polluting power plants with clean ones. So are they, those plants, those plants in large part are still running because they have to pay off the debt of existing. Yeah, to a first degree, that's true for many power plants okay. around the world, especially here in the United States, because in most places in the world, it is actually cheaper to build a new wind farm or a new solar farm than it is to keep running old coal plants, right. which is a pretty shocking thing when you think about it, yeah, right? We've, right. <laughs> we've already bought and paid for these coal plants, but it is definitively cheaper to build new renewables projects than to keep buying the coal and burning it in an existing coal plant. And so we just need to figure out the financing to make that happen. This feels like a... Like a you know, a, I want to say like a computer says no problem. Like a, yeah, it's not exactly. actually a problem. It's like a problem that is a problem because the system operates in this loop. Yeah. And actually, if you just broke the loop, then it wouldn't be the problem anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and there's some really good examples of breaking that loop, right? So here in the United States, fresh in my mind, because our team has been working on it for the past several years, the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act uh, that was signed by the president a couple weeks ago breaks the loop, as you say, right? It resets the conversation by providing assistance to coal plant owners in many cases to actually get out of that financing and replace those costly aging polluting power plants with carbon free alternatives. Okay. One of the things you, we talked about is this infrastructure being built, these big plants. How long does like a coal plant or a gas plant, how long is its lifespan? 40 to 60 years. So that's a really long time. Yeah. So this idea of even thinking about building new ones right now is really going in the wrong direction. It's redundant, then, right? Because yeah. they're not going to be able to be used for very long. Building new coal and gas plants, yeah. you mean? Yeah, certainly. Our team has done research showing that there's, again, round numbers, around $100 billion worth of proposed investment in new gas plants just here in the United States. And we've shown that within 10 years, about 75 to 80 percent of those plants would go out of business wow. if they were built because the cost of their competition, renewable energy, just keeps coming down. And of course, we did that analysis before the current energy prices, before natural gas prices tripled right. or quadrupled here in the United States. And so the, the math is even less favorable for those projects today than it was when we did this work a year ago. So what what is it that is, so why are people still doing it then? I, I'm, I, find, I find that really confusing. Like I don't understand what the, um, like what the motivation yeah. is. For people to, I'm not sure that you understand either. <laughs> I, I try. That's, right, okay. that, that, that's our day job. And the, the, the first answer is follow the money, right? We have right. monopoly utilities in many parts of the country here in the US and in many parts of the world and most parts of the world, actually, whose businesses have been set up since the beginning of the grid 100 plus years ago right. to build large projects sell the power from those projects to customers that don't have any other choice about where to buy electricity mm -hmm. and earn what we call a regulated rate of return, essentially a guaranteed return on investment for their shareholders. Mm -hmm. That is a really great business model if you can get it. And the opportunities that we have today are in many ways not easily compatible with that business model. We need to actually shift how these companies make money in order to help them be champions and help us decarbonize faster. Right. Because this, the, the, the new way of producing electricity is essentially moving towards a model where electricity is not going to cost very much, if anything. 
Uh, yeah, that's partly true. And, and actually, there's a really good example here where right now, if you build a wind plant or a solar plant, mm -hmm. the only cost that you're really incurring to do that is building the project in the first place. Mm -hmm. That is very different from a coal or a gas plant where you have to pay to build the project and then you have to pay for the fuel. For the thing that makes the Exactly. Thing you got to keep right. buying coal, got to keep buying gas. And often utilities uh, everywhere in the world are incentivized to build big projects, but don't really care if they how much they spend on fuel. So in some ways, renewables in particular are good for utility businesses. And here in the U.S., we've seen a number of leading utilities finally figure that out, mm -hmm. finally figure out how to take advantage of the cost structure of these assets and earn even greater returns for their shareholders while building renewables projects. So we just need to see that happen in more places faster. Okay. And how do we do, how do, we do that? What, is, what are the barriers to people that are stopping them from adopting the new method of doing this quick, fast enough, quick, quickly enough? I don't know if that's the right way of saying it, but yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the barriers, and I'll talk about it here in the U.S. because that's where my experience is, is the way that the tax code in this country is structured mm -hmm. and the way that you can bank tax credits for building renewables has actually prevented many utilities from taking full advantage of those tax credits over the past decade. Now, with the Inflation Reduction Act and the tweaks to the tax code that many smart folks worked on over the past two years, um, that's less of a problem, right? So we actually are going to see more utilities able to directly tie the tax credits that are part of the legislation mm -hmm. into benefits for their customers through lower electricity prices and keep their shareholders whole, continue to earn on those projects. So, you know, I think from an outsider's perspective, the thing that's mind blowing is that we expect the conversation about electricity and the, the barriers to moving to renewables to be about like, it's really expensive or we don't have the technology yeah. or like, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's actually like the tax, the tax system is not set up properly or the low, the debt system is not set up properly or whatever yeah. it might be. And that is from the outside, that's mind boggling that if this is not even a, it's not even a problem with the actual thing. It's a problem with the, the system it exists in. Yeah. I mean, you thought decarbonizing electricity was boring, but it's actually even more boring <laughs> than you thought. <laughs> because it's about taxes. <laughs> because it's about taxes. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's great. That should be your, your motto. Yeah, <laughs> it's more boring than you think. <laughs> um, one of the things I just want, you touched on, obviously, you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, how that's impacted mm. um, energy prices. I think that for a lot of people, these were, you know, the idea of, of global security, their energy, the environment are, are just very disparate things. And we're seeing it really come together. You know, for someone who's looking at this and being like, okay, how these things are related, but I'm not quite sure how to figure it out. Could you just give us like a little bit of a, um, a top line of how these things relate to one another and why we're seeing what we're seeing happening in the world? Yeah, what we're seeing is ripple effects across the global economy where, um, obviously, the supply of Russian gas into one of the biggest economies in the world in Europe is being constrained both by pressures within Europe and by decisions made in Russia. And the ripple effects of that are huge, right? So, for example, here in the United States, we have some of the easiest to access, cheapest natural gas in the world, mm -hmm. thanks to hydraulic fracking. We are now sending as much as physically possible of that gas to Europe mm -hmm. in order to backstop some of the supplies that are no longer flowing from Russia. That in turn has increased the cost of gas paid by me, my family, uh, businesses across the United States because now there is a market with Supply huge market. willingness to pay mm -hmm. in Europe for our gas that we're shipping across the Atlantic. And so that's a, a microcosm here yeah. of how the global energy system, especially as we commodify gas through shipping liquefied natural gas and big tankers across oceans, is intricately connected. And so even, you know, a conflict in one country can start to increase prices and create scarcity across the entire economy. Is there, ga is there gas in Russia? Are they are they fracking like in like from their actual land? They are. They're yeah. one of the biggest producers, right? They are right, one right. of the biggest producers, and they they ship most of it via pipeline, and they're starting to ship some of it or want to ship some of it via tankers via uh, li liquefied natural gas. Right, and so 
yeah, that's that's a uh, that was a good top line explainer. Yeah, and and I think <laughs> yeah. that you know it's it what it again as as someone l- looking at this you know from the outside, I think it just so beautifully illustrates how these are problems that are not respecting national borders. These are like problems that cross. So something happening in one part of the world is going to have an impact over here. Mm-hmm. You know, like like the carbon we emit in one part of the world is going to have extreme weather events somewhere else. Like there is this real in- interconnectedness of the, you know, the climate system, the economic system, the geopolitical security system. Yeah. And it gets even more complicated when you start to think about the dynamics between the global north and the global south in global north countries like the United States, like in Europe. We've built out massive power systems. Mm. We've uh, invested heavily in coal plants and gas plants in many countries in the global south. They have yet to do so and are still on the the uptick right, right. of electrifying their economies, providing electricity access to their citizens. And so the choices that are made in those countries are also being affected by the present crisis where, yeah. again, the price of natural gas that you could deliver into a growing economy in Africa or Southeast Asia mm-hmm. has tripled or quadrupled yeah. in the past you know, year. Right. So there's a huge impact on those countries energy trajectories as a result of the present crisis that's going to be felt long after any conflict is over. This kind of uh, leads to a question I wanted to ask, right, which is because you've been doing this for a significant amount of time and you've been you've led and worked on a bunch of different projects around renewables. How confident on a scale of one to ten, five being average, how (laughs) confident do you feel that this is this can be resolved? Um, And then also like how scalable are so the solutions that we have here or if we're talking about uh the united states we're talking about uh the uk the solutions that we have because it's it all sounds like super simple but you just alluded to the fact that other places are like maybe catching up or Mm. the, the same solutions won't necessarily work how scalable are the solutions or is it a question of like finding different ways of solving other problems in other places. Yeah. Well, in terms of confidence, I'm 10 out of 10. Okay. I am. I am. Oh, my gosh. But <laughs> wait, no, no, that. don't. Oh, no. <laughs> don't celebrate too quickly. I'm, I'm 10 out of 10 that we can do it. Mm-hmm. We know exactly how to mm-hmm. do it. Easy. We don't know if we can do it fast enough. Okay. And that's what gets me up every morning to go to work, right, is making sure that we don't miss chances to make the right investments, to set the right policies, to uh, you know grease the skids, if you will, on this transition so it happens at the pace we need to avoid right. the worst effects of global warming. In terms of um, scalability and how we can learn globally, there's tons of lessons to be learned globally. And one of the really great things that we've um, been involved with in RMI is not having those lessons go only from the U.S. to the global south or only from the global north to the global south. There's actually lessons flowing from every country into every other country right, right, because right. a lot of the countries that, you know, for example, don't yet have universal electricity access are finding really creative and innovative ways to uh, provide electricity to their citizens mm. in ways that are actually cleaner than we do here in the United States, in ways that are easier to pay for, more affordable in some cases than what we do here in the U.S. or in Europe. So um, we can and should be learning more from innovators across the globe as we jointly work on this shared problem. I have uh, a bit of a difficult or controversial question. <laughs> you don't have to answer it. Um <laughs> Is there a role for gas and coal in the global south in the next 20 years? And then and then if we look beyond that in the next 50 years. Yeah, Uh, it's an easy question, actually, (laughs) because there's already a current role for coal and gas in the global south. Right. We have many existing coal plants that are running in uh, global south countries from Southeast Asia to Africa everywhere. Uh, We have many gas plants that are part of the current power system. So, you know, from a factual basis, yes, those plants those plants are there and they will continue to to be there. The question is, is that actually the best choice for those countries? Ignore climate change Mm -hmm. for a moment. Is it actually the economical choice, the choice that 
improves energy access, improves affordability for the citizens of those countries, for the industries in those countries. And the emerging evidence, especially as gas prices and coal prices have gone through the roof Mm. this year and renewable prices have been on a 10 plus year downward trajectory, the emerging answer is no. We see a lot of evidence actually that building out the power system in countries, you know, as diverse as South Africa, Vietnam, Panama, actually makes a lot more sense to do with renewables than with coal and gas. A question I wanted to ask was, where are the places that are producing the coal and the gas? Because I feel like we talk we talk about coal and gas a lot, and it feels very like nebulous to me. I'm in my mind, it's like Minecraft and just hit the floor and things come out. But like, where where are where are they coming from? Are they coming? Is, yeah, <laughs> like I know. Sorry, I don't even play Minecraft. Um, are they coming from like the global? Is it coming from the global south? Is it coming from the global north? Like where is whereabouts are we finding? Because surely, based on the question you just asked, right? Surely for the people who are selling yeah. coal and gas, they stand to make if the prices are going up, they stand to make a significant amount of money. And they have trillions of dollars in windfall right. profits this year. Um, that's going to producers across the world. And there's a very complicated map of where fossil fuels okay. come from, but right. at a high level, uh, the U.S. Countries in the Middle East are the predominant exporters and Russia, predominant exporters and producers of natural gas. On the coal side, uh, Australia, Indonesia, China, the U.S. to some degree, and then diffuse coal mining and exporting all over the world. So there's a, a complicated political economy of yeah. who stands to gain from current uh, the current energy system and, and who stands to gain if actually those uh, producers have less influence and sway than they right. do today. Because, you know, the thing that, like, I get tri- tripped up on in this loop in my head, right, is I feel this sense where, where I start to feel anxious and, and, and hopeless is I think, you know, you have these countries in the global south who have been historically poorer economically, who are then now building out their infrastructure and their develop- and, and trying to develop economically through using fossil fuels. And these are countries that are often at the forefront of the impacts of climate change. Mm. And so then they're like trying to develop, but they're, in, in, you know, but they're con- now starting to contribute more to climate change or they will in the next 50 years if they stay on a certain trajectory, which then will impact them more, which will make them poorer. And I feel like this, it kind of like starts to spin in my head. Yeah. And I, I feel very, I feel like the answer, you, and I think that then I think get into this, like, is it a moral question? Is it an incentive question? But what you said, which I really liked, is that actually, just look at the economics. That is not going to be, even not thinking about climate change, it's just not going to be the way forward for these countries who want to economically develop. Yeah. So actually, it's not about saying, well, you can develop or you can be good for the climate. You can do both. Yeah. And that's not necessarily true today everywhere, to okay. be clear. It's impossible yeah. to paint yes. a broad, with a broad brush uh, you know, hundreds of countries uh, across the world sure. and claim that renewables work for everyone now, right? That's naive. Um, but again, we've seen many cases in many diverse economies where that is the case. Okay. Uh, and we've worked with partners on the ground in those economies to take advantage of that. And so we're confident that for some of the largest developing economies in the world, what you say is actually true. It's also true from an adaptation perspective, okay. right? We have seen, especially in the past couple years, the huge risks associated with fossil fuel-based electric power systems mm. in uh, adapting to extreme weather that we're seeing even at one and a half, uh, 1.1 degree C warming, let alone 1.5, let alone two. Uh, we, you know, as I, as we speak today, there's uh, a million people in Puerto Rico without power still four days after a major hurricane, five years after another major hurricane right. that knocked out power for months uh, or longer for many homes. That's because of the legacy fossil fuel based power system on that Island that We've tried to work on, especially in the last five years, but there's still just such a challenge in keeping the lights on in this time of climate change while relying on aging, large power plants far away from people. And increasingly, folks are finding when they do the math that you can have cheaper and more reliable power by putting non-fuel-based renewable power plants closer to people. Uh, and and getting rid of some of that risk of extreme weather due to climate change. I 
I'm just so grateful, Mark, for you taking the time to explain this to us. This, as you said, you know, is complex systems in some ways, mm -hmm. and then also some really clear answers in other ways. And I think, as it is, I think the global energy electricity sector is quite opaque. It's quite hard from the outside to understand it. So I feel like. I feel like I understand that a lot better now yeah. than I did before. And and it helps us see why energy and electricity specifically is such an important part of the climate conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we have one more thing we want to do before we end this interview. And now it's time for our climate confessions. Let's fess up to the bad habits we just can't kick. Sure. I probably have more than one. Yes, right, well, right, we... right. That's good. <laughs> good and bad at the same let, time. Let, let me pick one. Okay. My wife and I own a 15-year-old, very inefficient, gas-burning SUV. That Yo, this is a real We're American America. thing, We're in isn't America. It? <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm from the western United States, too, right. not, not here in New York City. So um, that's very common where I live. Right. And... I, I know because I work in the industry that uh, I could replace that vehicle and uh, use electricity to to move myself and my family around, and for various reasons, uh, hasn't happened yet. So. What are the reasons? Just desire. Well, I think uh, to be really direct, there's a lot of things that I like to do in the Western United States that require a car that runs on gas and has four wheel drive. And, right, right, and right. you live in the mountains, don't you? I have right? the mountains. Yeah. So okay. I, I drive, I drive from my home at, you know, 5,000 feet above sea level up over 11,000 foot passes towing a, a raft, right. Towing a, a, a 600 pound boat behind my car, right. which I can't really do in an EV very effectively today. Now that's changing, right. Yeah, to yeah, be, right? Like, to be clear cool in 2022, my my choice is probably rational, even if it's not the the best outcome for the climate. Mm. In 2024, that will not be the case. And even in 2023, as, as we see more and more electric pickup trucks yeah. come on the road, right? I'm sure you've seen the news about the F-150 Lightning yeah. or the Rivian R1T and other electric pickup trucks. You look quite excited about that. I, I really want one of those <laughs> right, trucks. Right, right, right. <laughs> I we love cars too, so you're talking to the right people. Here. I can't buy one yet, right? Like they're they're really hard to find here in the U.S. Yeah, and right. and they would work for what I need. And as the prices come down, mm -hmm. as the availability grows, I hope that if you ask me this question again in two years, I won't have the same confession. We'll come back. I love it. We're, we're I love it. it. I love it. Aspirational. We're gonna get you in two years and find out. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark, for for demystifying the global electricity system for yeah. us. And remember, stay curious. Thank you for joining us this week. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit the follow button to make sure you get next week's release. We are now officially crowdsourcing Climate Confession, so please leave yours in the ratings and the review section, and we'll shout out for you next time. And shout out to our fabulous team behind the pod. This episode was produced by Josie Coulter, artwork designed by Rebecca Mingus, Curation by Marion Pasha. Mix and engineers by Ben Beheshti. Music also by Ben Beheshti. Presented by Ben Hurst. And Marion Pasha. Remember, stay curious. <laughs> <laughs>